Hello everyone. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar where we will be discussing electric vehicles and charging infrastructure. This webinar is specifically targeting consulting engineers and people involved in advising customers on how they should be using this technology. The talk is going to start giving you a little bit of a background around electric vehicles and why electric vehicles will be the future. Once you've got those basics in place, we'll dig into a little bit more technical things. All right, so, so Grid Cars as a company does a couple of things. The first thing is we're a charge point supplier. And so we, we have a range of both AC and DC charging systems. Part of the technology is actually developed locally in South Africa, so we've got very, very good support on the ground in South Africa. We're an, a charge point operator. So what we do is we manage charge points on behalf of customers. A customer would come to us and they purchase 20 of a particular charging system, not necessarily from us. And what they've done is they've then, they've then put those charges online and we then do the monitoring of those charging systems for them. We also connect them into the back end to allow those, the systems to become active so you can do billing with them, etc. We also then do an e-mobility system solution. E-mobility is basically where we then manage the billing side of these things. So we have customers who have their cards and those cards are then managed in the background. And finally, we've got a investment network. So we've actually deployed a network ourselves where we've gone out into the field and um, we've physically put charge points down on the ground. And those charges then form a backbone in South Africa, basically on the N1, the N2, the N3, and the N4. And that backbone is where everything else is going to get built from and will be pulled around. So why electric vehicles? The first thought is, is it really going to happen? Is it really viable? So the, the biggest reason why it's going to happen it's quite simply that if you take any seven units of energy, liters, kilowatts, and you put them into, into a normal petrol car, you need about 85% of those. And about six, so six units of the seven go straight out the back of the car in a puff of smoke, and only one of those units actually gets to the wheels of the vehicle in terms of driving that vehicle forward. Whereas in electric, it's exactly the other way around. So it's about efficiency. They don't make noise, they don't pollute, and they really, really are a lot more efficient. I know the slides lag by about two seconds. A lot of people might say, is it really clean? And, you know, will it last? Are we going to see it? Well, firstly, yes, absolutely, it's clean. If you look at an electric vehicle, it takes about one kilogram of coal to make 1.4 kilowatt hours of electricity, and that gives us about 10 kilometers of range. Whereas if you're looking at a fossil fuel vehicle, it takes about four kilograms of coal to make one liter of fuel, and that gives you, again, about 10 kilometers of range. So we actually really have... From a tech point of view, it is more efficient, it is cleaner, and it will result in less emissions. In spite of everything you might hear, at the end of the day, there are less emissions from electric vehicles. Just some modern, well, some pictures from the last few days or last few weeks. I suppose everybody's seen them already, but basically, this is the difference in India with lockdown. So cars really, really do make a huge difference in the pollution of certain areas. There's LA, so same, same challenges they're facing in LA. And in China, of course, exactly the same. So it really does make a difference. And I think after this, people are going to properly realize that. And we're going to see a lot more things happening in, the, in, the, in this. The other thing is that often people would say, yes, but we have got cleaner things. We've got biodiesels and we've got all these types of biogas. This quick table just shows you roughly if we took a hectare and we used that one hectare to grow by uh, some sort of form of product and that that product is going to go into biodiesel, bioethanol, biomass. It gives you the idea you get 21,000 kilos, 60,000 kilos, maybe 67,000 kilos. But if you put solar panels on that one hectare, you're sitting with 3.2 million kilometers. It is unbelievable on what we can actually see. So, um, you know, we, we really need to understand that it's a really efficient use of energy and we'll be able to get a lot of these technologies going forward with that. The other question that people then often ask is they would say things like, you know, yeah, but Eskom doesn't have enough power. I think the important thing is Eskom absolutely does have enough power, especially at night. We, what we find is that generally Eskom challenges are, are power-related issues, not energy-related issues. So it's wanting too much energy at the same time in the same place. With electric vehicles, we can look and we can strategically charge them. Maybe overnight we can charge, or we can charge them when we know that there's available power. By places like, or things like solar, when we know there's solar available, there's excess energy available on the um, network. The next thing is people often talk about battery swapping. Now, yes, I think at one time battery swapping might have been feasible for electric vehicles, but the challenge really is 
that the battery is pretty much the car. It constitutes the major part of the structural integrity of the vehicle. It constitutes the major part of the price of the vehicle, of, the, of all sorts of other things that are part of that car. All of the parameters that you measure a vehicle on, so price, performance, maintainability, all of those things are encapsulated in the battery. To get that common across all car brands, I don't believe it's going to be possible. And also, that said, we are seeing batteries in the lab today that are getting to you know, levels of, of production that are just unbelievable. You know, we're expecting a 1,000-kilometer battery maybe within the next two or three years. So battery technology is evolving so quickly that I think the idea of being battery swapping is really just never going to be feasible. Things are going to change. And I think it's quite important that we understand that the business is going to change. It's going to change. Your customers are going to change. The people that you're working with and the types of buildings and types of installations that you put in, they're all going to change. Just to give you some examples of that, you know, when petroleum first came out um, and they started using this in the early 1900s, or late 1800s, um, the people that made the most businesses was pharmacies. So pharmacies were the only people licensed to sell petrochemicals or chemicals. So what happened was pharmacies started becoming the filling stations, and you can see what it looked like. Lots and lots of bottles. It really became difficult. So the next step was to say, well, can't we send the cars around the back and pump it straight into the car? And that's certainly what they did. There was also a company called Lightning Motor Fuel that really believed that the future lay in um, supplying fuel on the go. So they would actually drive around and look for cars parked on the side of the road, stop there, and they'll just fill them up as they need it. Maybe that's a good idea for today. All of these technologies have evolved. If we look out there, you know, something like a fuel station, this would, what, would have been what it looked like when I was young. And, you know, did any of that or particular, did this person that is standing in the front of this photo think that that's what it would look like in just a few years? So this industry has evolved massively. We're now going to see another big change. And part of that change is going to happen to the fuel stations, but it's also going to be happening in other areas. How quick do these changes happen? Well, if you look at the picture on the left, it was a picture taken in 1900 on Easter morning. You can see one car. It's got a little red circle around it. What, just literally 13 years later, you can only there's only one horse. I don't know if you can see it, but it's sort of in the same position as where the car was. That was just 13 years to see a change from horses to the automotive things. When these changes start happening, they happen fast, and they happen faster than what we're going to be able to respond properly to it. So we've almost got to respond early in order to be, have a, a reasonable response over time. I think what I always like to make it very clear, what we're moving from, from the filling station, we're moving from something which we see as a filling station at the top to much more something that we see at the bottom. A lot of the technology that's going to be done is going to move towards office blocks in terms of filling your cars. You're going to fill your cars at work. You're going to fill your car when you stop for a meal, when you go to do shopping. All of those places will start to become that. Filling stations will have a big role when you're doing inter, um, intercity travel because they've got strategic locations, and that's the big thing big fuel stations have going for them, is they really do have strategic locations. And those locations will firstly evolve to become places where you can spend a little bit longer and um, take a bit more time there. But secondly, a lot of charging will move towards shopping centers and, and office blocks. Is an idea of what a filling station in the future might look like. So, you know, refilling at the bottom, the top might be a lot more like a business center. It'll be a lot more people friendly and people that will be wanting to spend a bit more time at these places and be catered for that. For that. Okay, so a lot of people would talk, start off by saying, yeah, but maybe this doesn't really happen that quickly in South Africa. You know, we are on the bottom end of Africa, and it's going to all happen a lot slower. This is the plan for the rest of the world. I'll, I'll share these slides with you afterwards. So you can see on, but I'm going to just highlight a couple of points within that slide. And look at what they're saying. 2025, BMW says 80% of all cars will be electric from their side. Um, Exxon Mobil, you've got to believe these guys. They sell oil. So if they say 30% of new car sales will be, will be EVs. The Netherlands, Paris, Scotland, all will be banning EVs or looking for zero emission vehicles by 2030. Europe is expecting 100% of new, EVs, new car sales to be EVs. Now, we have to start thinking about this. We're here in South Africa. Where do most of our cars come from? They come from Europe. Do you think Europe is going to make a couple of thousand petrol vehicles to go to South Africa? Absolutely not. So if all new cars in, by 2035 in Europe are going to be electric, 
And even if there's only a chance of that, we will not get products. The products will be something that we're going to only see the petrol vehicles will not be available to South Africa. We won't have a choice. We will have to move to electric. So the chances are 2035, we will be forced to move in that direction. And maybe we can debate it. Maybe it's 2040, maybe it's 2050, somewhere around there. So I want to quickly look at two of those scenarios for you. This model looks at what is happening over the next 15 years only. So these two columns on the sides, what the first one says, if we stop selling fossil fuel cars by 2040, the other one says if we stop selling cars by 2050. Keep in mind that 2040 is five years after the rest of the world. 2050 is 15 years after the rest of the world. I don't know where we'll find cars in those 15 years, but let's look at the scenario. What we're going to sit with is if we look at a total fleet, in order to be able to stop selling fossil fuel cars by 2040 and by 2050, we would need to have an electric car fleet of 2.8 million. We would need, um, in the 40 case or in the other case, 1.2 million um, electric vehicles. We will have invested, if we take the 2040 scenario, we will have invested 7.6 billion rand into charging infrastructure. And our electricity cost at that stage on a yearly basis would be about 98 billion rand is where the electricity would be in terms of actual electricity supply to those electric vehicles. This is where a big portion of new business is going to come from. And for people like shopping centers and for various other office parks, etc., this is going to become a revenue stream for them. So let's start taking a look at the technology. Firstly, the, these are the plug types that are currently allowed in South Africa. And I'm going to go through them in much, much more detail. This is just included again for prosperity so that when we, when I send you the slides that you can see the, the detail of all of this. So firstly, we'll start with DC charging. The DC side of charging is where the rectifier or the charger sits on the side of the road outside of the car. And the charging technology talks directly to the battery management system and charges the battery directly. If we talk about AC technology, AC technology means we supply AC electricity to the car and the car has a charger inside of the car that charges the battery. So we're just supplying a standard AC feed to the car where it will then charge the battery from inside. Firstly, DC, because we go direct to the battery, we can push a lot more current. We're not dependent on any power electronics inside of the vehicle. Whereas on AC, we're very dependent on the power electronics inside of the vehicle for the charger. So there are four basic standards internationally. I'll quickly run through them. There's one called Shadimo, which is really started in Japan. There's uh, GBT, which is the Chinese standard. And then there's what we call Combo 1, which is an American standard, or it started in America, and then Combo 2, which is very much the EU standard. In South Africa at this stage, there are only two vehicles that come into South Africa with um, plug types. The first plug type is the Shadimo one, and the second one is the Combo 2s. And I'm going to try and dispel some rumors around this because there's always a lot of discussion and there's always a lot of things that say, yeah, we've got to cater for both types. Well, we, we cater for both types if we don't know who's going to win the race. And five years ago, that wasn't clear. So in Europe and America, they're trying to cater for both types and most of the charging systems have both um, Shadimo and Combo 2 as a standard on the charging stations. But we've come a lot further and I'll, I'll run through the next few slides quite quickly, but just to give you an idea of where, where we're going. Firstly, the main difference between these two standards is the one uses CAN. CAN is a communication standard which is specifically for inner vehicle communication. It was never really designed for external vehicle communication. Whereas PLC is what's used by the combo standard, and PLC has a full TCPRP stack. You have full security on that interface. So it, it, it by definition is a better standard for communicating outside of the vehicle because you can impose security on that standard. Also, there's, in terms of the actual power, the old the Shadima being one of the oldest standards around, it's really only a 62 kilowatt standard. There are new um, proposals that they say they can go up to 200 kilowatts. But if you look at where the CCS standard is, it's up at 350 kilowatts already, and they're doing testing to 650. So it's really going to go a lot faster in terms of the standards. On the AC side, there's really only two. It's type one and type two. There has been some perception that Type 1 or 2 is a choice. It's not really a choice because Type 1 is a single-phase plug and Type 2 is a three-phase plug. South Africa is a three-phase country. We are a three-phase three plug. And also in terms of actual power, if you look right down at the bottom, 
you can only deliver about 7.4 kilowatts through a single phase connector, whereas you can deliver 44 kilowatts through a, a three phase connector. So there's, there's certainly a lot more power that can be delivered on the same type of connector. Gives you some idea. What's quite important, I'm just going to flip one screen back, and that is if you look at the field, at the combo two plug, look at the connector, it looks exactly the same as the one for the type two. So it's this, they share the plug, they share connectors on that plug. So it really makes a lot more sense and, and as a better technology. So this is the technology that's been used in South Africa at this stage. There are a couple of the older Nissan Leafs that came into the country using the type one, but in general, we're using type two. Just for completeness, a nice complete detailed thing of the two plug standards, but let's have a look. This is a picture that is often shown when people are presenting and talking about Shademo and about um, what we call CCS. So combo to the name that's really CCS, which stands for Combined Charging Standard. This picture is used to sort of show people that actually there's more support for Shademo than what there is for the CCS standard. This slide was published by ABB. What a lot of people don't realize is this slide was published in 2010. So let's have a look at what really happened. There's the picture. So that's what it looked like in 2010. 2017, it looked like that. So we can see some, some of the people moving off of the um, Shademo and onto CCS. More people moving onto CCS and more vehicles are coming in using CCS. 2019, 2020 is where we stand today. So from a technology, Shademo really doesn't have the, the current support within the automotive industry. I told you that first image was put up by ABB. So ABB's latest image, unfortunately, is still a year or two old. Shows and you can see there in the middle, in that orangey section, that's the Shademo ones. And there's nobody planning to bring out new vehicles or launch new vehicles using Shademo. Whereas if you look at the other two lines, top right corner, that's all the vehicles that have come into the market or that are coming into the market, and all of them are coming in using CCS. So CCS is the clear winner in this race. We have made a decision as a company that we predominantly install CCS. We will install Shademo if a particular client comes to us and, we, and we're looking to install because they may have old Nissan Leafs and they want to still be able to do um, fast charges. So then to give you some idea of what the actual charging systems look like, firstly, this, just, this is AC, typical AC systems. Again, 230 volts up to 400 volts, 16 amps or 32 amps, typical power, 7.4 to 22 kilowatts. You're talking charging times of between two and eight hours and the prices range from 10,000 Rand to 60,000 Rand. This is typically for your shopping centers, business parks, and destinations, hotels, where you're sleeping over the night. So wherever the car is quite comfortable being plugged in for eight hours, at your office, and when you're going to sleep over at a hotel or at your home, this will be the typical power units that you're going to be using in those. So people with longer dwell times. Once we move over to the DC side of the charging space, now the, we're, we're always running on three phase. The amperage can vary quite radically depending on the power of the unit, so anything from 50 amps to 300 amps. Power can range from 30 kilowatts to 50, 150 to 350 kilowatt systems that we can supply today. Charging times vary from 15 minutes up to maybe two hours. Two hours would be a car that's totally empty and a big car, a car with a big battery in it that has a lot of energy that we've got to transfer into that battery. Typical pricing of these, and please don't ever hold us to these, these are really just ind indicative prices. So typical pricing, you're looking at roughly about 300,000 for a smallish system, 500,000 for a normal system. I say normal, 60 to 80 is what good cars has been installing across the country. It's what most of the shopping centers are using if they are installing a, um, DC and not AC. The newer technology as we move to 150s and 350s, you're talking about a million rand a, a system or 2.3 million rand. Again, this still is for shopping centers and business parks, but it's now where people are just stopping in. So if you've got a business park that typically people would drive from far and come into the business park, ideal to put a fast charger down. Fast chargers need to be used. People have to be charging on them in order to be able to make your money back on it. So really it is people looking for lower dwell times and for travelers, people that are moving on the highway. So when we put down chargers on the open highways, it's always going to be DC and fast charging systems. This is just, again, a grid. Again, I won't go through this, but it's included for completeness. This will show you some idea of each of the different charging systems and the different categories of cars. So you've got a hybrid category. You've got an EV, um, small, normal range car, 150 kilometers, and then the bigger range EVs like I-Pace and coming in, in this year will be Mercedes and probably Audi. We're going to see a lot more vehicles on the road that have really big ranges, especially in the luxury car market. 
so let's get down to what is it what is it about when we install in a charging uh, charging system firstly this is just a real high level view of what it looks like so basically two parking bays and a charging station that stands behind it maybe with some sort of weather protection over it a nice busy slide for you there are many ways to install so if you look in the top left corner that's where we've got a wall in front of the parking lot then what we've got to do is the charger is a big thing so the charger then has to take up a parking space or part of a parking space and the two parking spaces then go to the sides of the charger so it gives you some idea of how we install when there's a wall in front of the charger when there's no wall and you've got a walkway sort of midway down on the left hand side you can see there's um that means we've got a walkway or some place where we can install the charger off the parking then the two parkings can be next to each other and of course there are various combinations of this and you can see that we've got very detailed drawings that we can supply once we supply equipment and those very detailed drawings we give you a sample on the right hand side it shows you exactly how to position how to paint the bays where we expect them to be etc right down at the bottom you can see the typical signage that is used in the um, industry and these are to direct people to where charging stations are so that they can get to their station get to and get on charging as quickly as possible on the electrical side of it i don't claim to be anywhere near as competent as what um, hardy is but hardy gave me a quick join this morning and i quickly put that in and basically what we're saying is we've got a main circuit breaker inside of your main supply db and that circuit breaker as per normal installations would be there to uh, or be sized appropriately to protect the cable typically if we're looking at uh, small installations 40 amp um, circuits but up to an 80 kilowatt 160 amp breaker the cable obviously then very much depends on what amperage we are running and what distance it is i know this says 32 32 square millimeters up to 70 square millimeters but we've installed big ones in that when we've got longer sites we might have to go to 100 or even uh, bigger bigger um, uh, cable sizes within reach of the, the charging station close to the charging station remember that the this circuit breaker could now be 100 meters away from where the charging station is we would then put down another isolation box we say within three meters the idea behind that is going to be a lockable box so that you can isolate and switch off the power if you're going to be working on the system and then you can lock the db and that nobody can get to it and switch it back on while your electrician is sitting with his head inside of the charge point so there's your typical installation that's really 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 simple obviously the real hard work comes in that 100 meters there could be civil works there could be trenching that's going to be done you could be going across tar roads there could be all sorts of challenges faced in getting that distance that you've got to get to the charging station typical locations that we would consider ideal for charging firstly i've always been of the opinion that you have a high visibility put it here where everybody can see it and that's good it's good for now when you're putting your first charger down and when you're trying to raise awareness because a lot of what we're doing at this time is really making people sensitive to the fact that electric vehicles are coming and this is what a charging station looks like and putting that information out there as you start to expand it makes more sense to move the charging stations away from where the normal parking is ev drivers don't mind walking a little bit if they are getting a a, a charge and if the charging is free or is less or is uh, more cost effective for them that's also nice but the idea is that they don't mind it being a bit further away because what they don't want is petrol cars parking where the electric cars must park the idea behind it is that if if people are parking we call it icing by the way so there's an internal combustion engine parked in your electric bay so we really don't want vehicles icing the electric vehicles being close to the power outlet is important because as the length of that cable goes up the thickness of the cable goes up the cost goes up the cost of civils the cost of everything goes up so the closer you can be to a power outlet the better what we really do talk when we talk to people who are building new properties building sites is to say start to put think about where your electric vehicle things will go and get the trenching in place get things ready so that when we come along we don't have to come and dig it up a second time or when you're going to put down a charging station that you don't have to do that yourself as you expand that network you are looking for a place where you've got a reliable connection to the internet if you don't have a reliable connection to the internet through hard line through ethernet cable then at least make sure that it's in an area where there is good cell phone signal because we can put modems in but we all have got sites where it's not accessible with um, ethernet and putting down a modem or we've put down modems and the signal is really bad and we're having to then look at putting down multi-sim modems and trying to find other strategies to get the internet working because these charges have to be connected if specifically if you want to do billing if you're doing free charging well maybe not then you don't need it but it also helps having it connected because what we're then able to do is monitor the charging stations and see that there are no problems 
see that everything is good on the charging station within this time, that it's online. Make sure that the customer is going to have a, a positive experience when he gets to the charger. Clear directional signage that you can point to where the charging locations are. Safe locations, because often people are going to come and charge in the middle of the night. So it is important to ensure that the locations are relatively safe. Obviously, this is an electric device, clear from any water, fuel, or other hazards. Undercover is nice. Down at the coast, probably much more important because you're going to get a lot more rain down there. Um, and also, it helps to keep the charger out of the salt air. Finally, if it can be fed from re renewable energy, what a bonus. And we really do encourage that. We really like that. Um, I think it just makes so much more sense. You've got somebody who's driving a green vehicle who's really understands the environment and wants to see things be going forward in a more positive direction, I think renewables is the way that that's got to go as well. Just again, just to give you an idea of the installation guides that if you were installing a grid cars charger and any of the other chargers in the market would have similar installation guides, gives you some idea of how to, where the plinth has got to be done, how to mount the plinth, where, how your mounting levels of everything and how it will actually be done. That just gives some guidance on the installations. That gives you some idea of actually installed sites. So all of these are outside are live. The top right-hand one is actually on the inside one. It's at Bay West Shopping Center. The one on the top left is in George. And the bottom two are both at fuel stations. So it gives you an idea of how, how those installations look. The, over time, we'll look at doing more. We'll start to put up solar carports. We'll start to, to do different things, make more things happen around the charging stations. Future-proofing. What's quite important is when you get in a, a charger, whatever charger you're going to buy, ensure that you have a modular system. So you can get a charger that has a single 60 kilowatt module inside of it. If something goes wrong with that 60 kilowatt module, you've got no power, nothing at all. If you look at all the grid cars chargers, we work on particular module sizes. So this is a 20 kilowatt module. So it's a 60 kilowatt system in total. You can see three modules, three 20 kilowatt modules there, and that will give it 60 kilowatts. You can see there's an open rack, and that open one will take another one to upgrade to an 80 kilowatt. So this rack can hold anything from a 20, a 40, a 60, or an 80 kilowatt system. So the idea is that you can then upgrade it and you can scale it. We've got racks for other systems that can take up to 150 kilowatts to make sure there's additional parkings available. Because once you start expanding, you don't have to now go and find parkings because you've, you picked two parkings that were completely on their own. Understand that this will expand over time. Make sure that there's space, especially in new builds, make sure there's space to expand the DB. Put an empty cabinet there or, a, or at least space that you know you can put down a DB because you're going to need lots of connectors running charging systems to manage those things. Then if you're not going to install cabling in a new site, at the very least install ducting in that site to make it easy to get the cabling out to where the charging things are. So it takes a little bit of thinking ahead of saying, all right, we might not install this now, but while we're digging up the ground, let's at least get the, the basics in place for it. You can also look at split systems. Now, I'm gonna show you a picture now of a split system. And really what that is, is where we put all the DC and the hardcore electronics in a box away from where the physical charge points are. Because as we get more and more power in these charge points, the physical charges are getting bigger and bigger. And to put it in front of a charging station becomes difficult. So we then want to look at putting a smaller, what we would then just call a charging pod or a point and we'd put the bigger system at the back, which has all the power electronics in it. And then finally, you want to be compliant with ISO 15.11.8. Don't need to worry too much about that. Basically, this is the standard that defines how charging is working. There's some things inside there around security that are only coming into the vehicles over the next year or two. We want to make sure that the charging system is capable of being able to respond to that. So just to give you some quick ideas, this is what some charging stations look like overseas. Gives you a good idea. Lots and lots of bays get used in these systems, and it's really amazing to see a charging station like that. Um, this is the split system I mentioned earlier, so you can see the container in the front of the image is where all the DC electronics sits. And if you look at where the cars are parked, those are 150 kilowatt charge points. So each point there can charge 150 kilowatts, but it's, a very, it's been completely distributed, so the power electronics is separated from where the actual charging stations are. Now we move on to smart charging. So with smart charging, there's a couple of high level elements that we, that we like to deal with. The first part of smart charging is it's really about understanding the shared use of limited capacity. It's about managing demand, and it's about understanding demand, not just at the site, but within the area and potentially within the metropolitan um, zone. 
Next thing is supporting the grid, because with smart charging, you can give better support, especially around things like solar, renewable energy, and, and it can provide additional backup into the sites. And finally, you can even look at battery systems. You know, we've done a couple of installations where, where the availability of power is really limited at the site. So what you want to do is buffer the, the municipal power into a battery so that when a car connects, that we can charge at full power by offloading from the battery systems. So smart char charging within the site. So that looks and says, if a site has got limited availability, what we want to do is we want to consume as much of that limited availability as possible. And as the site consumes energy itself, we will step down the usage of the energy from the charging perspective. Now that can be done at an area level. So if ESCOM is looking or the municipality is looking and saying, within this area, we only want to spend five megawatts and the chargers are looking that if the chargers can see what those things and have sight of that to the municipality or to Eskom, for example, what they're able to do is then step back the power of the charge point to make the room to allow us to stay within those norms and within those um, systems. It's really important to have a knowledge of where charging is going to be. So then we want people to tell us where you're going to go because we understand and the system can then start to balance these things and understand how we're going to manage with that. We want to understand trends. When do people typically charge? Because if you're not going to tell us when you're going to get there, we've got to guess. And in order to guess, we'd need to understand and manage those trends. And this is a lot of what grid cars and the systems and the way that we're managing data at this stage, how we deal with these sort of things. You need smart integration. And I always say it's always about what you need and not what, not what you want. Um, so we need to really look at how we're going to smartly connect into those networks. We're looking for a variety of billing models where we can have time of use, we can have maximum demand type things, we can have incentives and disincentives. So the system has got a vouchering system. It's got um, various other ways of balancing where we can bill more or bill less in terms of uh, trying to encourage people to use charging at a certain time. And all of these things are built into what's called the back office of, um, of managing charging systems. Just some quick ideas here, and, and this is um, something I did for the storage guy people, and I think it, it really brings the point home. So if we start off in a normal house or a normal home, you're coming into a microgrid within an area, 1.5 megawatts, let's say there's a couple of hundred homes, or I think this says 500 homes. If you're going to start to bring EVs into that, you're probably going to have to step up the power in the area. So the 1.5 megawatts is not nothing anymore, you need 1.9. Um, and that's using 100 EVs. If you're going to do smart charging, so you're not going to switch all the cars on at the same time. You can balance them out because um, you know when somebody's going to be leaving in the next morning, you can charge it later. You don't need to charge it at 7 when you plug in. So all the smart charging starts shifting that load and leveling that load out a little bit. So maybe you drop the overall requirement in the area to 1.7 megawatts. So again, better, better than not, than not controlling it. More importantly, if you start looking at local storage, local storage within the properties, then um, what you can do is you can start to store something locally, and that means when there's really peak demand, we can actually pull from the battery instead of actually pulling that out of there. And we can drop that thing all potentially all the way down to 1.2 megawatts, being more efficient than what it would have been if we hadn't introduced EVs and all of these clever and smart charging technologies that we get. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to level the playing field. Instead of us having a really big spread in our thing, lots of energy in the daytime, very little at night, what we want to do is try and bring that level back. And that's what smart charging is all about. I spoke about the ISO 15118. So these are digital certificates. So basically, as we're moving forward in this technology and in order to prevent hacking and all sorts of things like that, we're going to see manufacturers issuing certificates for the cars. They're already doing that. We're going to see e-mobility providers issuing certificates to their customers. And charge points will get their certificates from the charge point operator. And basically what will happen is those, those certificates from the car, from the customer, and from the charger will all go forward and sign the transaction to ensure that these things are secure and that we can manage that. When this technology comes out, the charging systems need to be ready to accommodate that and deal with it as they, as they go forward. Just looking at some of the other technology around what we're talking about. So I've mentioned a few things, e-mobility. So e-mobility is the management of the cards. It's the management of payments. It's, it's the management of the customer. So it deals with special pricing. It deals with special services to members. It deals with statements to give the customer a statement, and show the customer what his charging sessions are. What you would have if, you were, if you're doing this and you had a, a, an EV, you'd have a little app on your phone. What it will do is that this app will show me where my charging is, it will show me how many sessions I've done, and I'm going to start and stop 
the charging sessions that I've got. So that's what we call with e-mobility. The three major e-mobility players in the market today is grid cars, which is active charge, charge now, which is actually owned by BMW, and the final one is Jaguar Electrify. So those are the three e-mobility providers currently in the market. So we can manage a white label card for a particular customer. So the customer came in and said, we'd like to have a special loyalty card for our, our property that we can do some fancy things with, like give free charging to our tenants or discounted charging to our tenants, but normal charging to the public. That's where e-mobility comes into it. E-mobility also manages roaming. So what you'll find is that currently on the Charge Now network, they don't allow other cards to work on their network. You must have a Charge Now card to work on the Charge Now network. Um, that is changing. Whereas you can see between Active Charge and Jaguar Electrifiers, we've got a roaming agreement, which means the Active Charge card can work on a Jaguar charge point, and the Jaguar card can work on a grid cars charge point or an Active Charge charge point. Once the charge points have been installed, they've got to be managed. And that back-end service, there's a service fee for that. So that's something Gridcars does called charge point operations. There are different levels of the, of, the, of the service, but basically it allows us to talk to the charge point, understand what errors are happening, report errors to the customer, report errors to the suppliers or to maintenance teams that will go and repair those charge points if they need to be, even do some fairly simple things like restarting charge points if there seems to just be a, a simple problem with it, and then supporting the customers when they get to the charging stations. There are a lot of other services that we can offer once a charge point is in the ground. Things like insurance, we can look at full maintenance um, objectives, we can help customers to develop their own custom business models. We do consider co-investment in strategic locations. We sometimes have customers that are looking for branding and we can do PV installations. We work very closely with our sister company called SolarF and they would be doing most of those um, installations for us. The future of charging if we look, we've spoken about AC charging, so that's the one on the left. And it's really about 7.4 kilowatts if you're taking a small one or up to 22 kilowatts. With the type of DC charging we've been talking about in South Africa up to now is 50, 60, 80, 100 kilowatts. And that, you know, quite a bit more power, a lot bigger systems, but still manageable within the grid. Once we start exceeding 100 kilowatts and go to 150 and 350 kilowatts, now grid becomes a big challenge. And then we sometimes have to start looking at battery support. So where the battery can buffer into the battery, battery and then run out the charge after that. The, these are the much bigger, more complex systems. Obviously, if you're in a place where you've got a lot of grid power, great, no problem, you wouldn't need the battery support, but the battery support becomes something that's more. So it helps to manage those peaks and helps to level. A big battery or a good battery in an area there to support a charger can also then be used for storing solar. It can also be used for doing things like load balancing on the site or demand management. So it can, it can perform a whole bunch of functions and allow the site to be more energy efficient because they have a better tech, set of technology on that site. When we install um, car charging stations, if we look at carports, you can typically get about 3.6 kilowatts on a single, on a single garage. If we move to a, a dual garage, then we can maybe do a 7.2 kilowatt or 7.4 kilowatt, more or less. If you're looking to run or solar a single DC system, you need about 14 parkings to cover the power or get the power that you would need for one DC charging system. So typically grid support and hybrid systems are the way that you need to go with these things. Yes, solar is great and when you're charging, you use the solar first, but at the end of the day, having a good grid support system or hybrid system is really what it's going to all be about as we go forward. I thought I'd quickly just stop on giving you a little bit of a, uh, an example. It's a case study. Part of this was actually done for a client. I'm not mentioning the client on the slide, but effectively what you can do is it's a shopping center. They have an installed capacity of electricity of about five megawatts and roughly about 10,000 parking bays. So the analysis was to say, let's assume that we're going to paint one fifth of those parking bays electric. Remember when you spoke about this earlier, over the next 15 years, roughly about a quarter of our fleet could be electric or more. Having one fifth of the actual fleet being for electric charging, that's not too bad. And remember, we move in the filling station or the requirements of a filling station, a large part of those, into the shopping centers or into the business parks. So this is the debate that's going to be had. How do we manage that? So in the first case, we say, all right, let's put the smallest charger down. So 7.4 kilowatts only. And we're using 20% of the parking bays that would require 15 megawatts. Now, in this particular cli client, 
they said they might be able to push up to 8 megawatts, but they wouldn't be able to push to 15 megawatts extra. That's over and above. They would need 20 megawatts at the site just to cover 20% of their parking bays. So I'm not saying you need to plan for this at that level, but you do need to start thinking, how is this going to work in the future? How will we scale it? And maybe have a couple of strategies around how you will scale that going forward with your, with your sites. If we look at the second case where we bring in um, some fast chargers, so remember this was all 7.4, the slowest of the AC chargers. So if we then say, all right, we'll make 18% of the parking 7.4s and 2% will be fast chargers, because maybe the shopping center is a little bit more of a strategic location where people are often going to come there, they're going to want to fill up and go. So they're really looking for that. They've seen it as a replacement of, of their petrol or their petrol fill up. Now we're suddenly at 2% of the parking base, we'd need just we'd need 30 megawatts just for the fast chargers. That gives us a total of need at the site of 44 megawatts of, of power. These are big changes. These are big and disruptive things. And we've got to understand these are the implications that customers are going to be faced with as they go forward. Typically, just to put some perspective to that, if we've got 2% of the parking bays in this particular site, that would have been 200 parking bays that were done with fast chargers. And that would service between 800 and 1,000 clients a day on average. That would be the equivalent of two to three filling stations. Could net about 100,000 a day in profits on selling electricity. These become a real strategy for, for shopping centers and for, for other sites to look at how they're going to deliver that. There's going to be an interesting battle that we're going to see in the industry. The first thing is shopping centers are going to start taking people to charge. So they're going to want people to come and spend time at the shopping centers they can charge. But the other side of it is when you see the filling stations broadening their offering and making better offers to customers and also and draw customers in because they want to keep your, um, using those sites. And in some sites they will win, in the other sites they won't. They will need to look at moving or, or, or having less of those um, stations, especially in the suburbs. So the challenges that we've faced over the over the few years, I'll, I'll run very quickly through it. The first thing is just getting legal agreements in place. For the, you know, we need to make sure that we've got responsibilities and you've got responsibilities. The second thing is availability of power at the site. So we've definitely had a few sites where we've really got challenges with availability of power. And we need to look at trying to um, upgrade those sites, either with battery packs or getting them again with solar. So it would benefit the business anyway. So those are sort of the discussions that we're happening. And it's especially in the smaller towns. So that's just and then the sustainability of the site. So you know, if we're going to put them down to the site, we want to know we're taking quite a big expense of putting charging stations down, or the customer is experiencing quite a big expense in putting a charging station down. He wants to know that that site is going to be profitable for a few years. Because if he, if he puts it down and two years later, they want to close down the site, that's not going to work for them. Really need to understand that sustainability going forward. Network access, education for the people at the site. This is a new technology. I found it so refreshing when we installed our, our first charging system. The first one that went live on the highways was done at an engine site at Bergview down in Harry Smith. We put the charger down and the first car arrived just after we commissioned it in terms of company was planned. So the, the car arrived there to come and do some testing. By the end of that charging session, there were already some of the, the people working at the, at the filling station were already understanding what this was about and were prepared to come and help the customers and say, hey, can I show you how to do this, etc." Most of the customers already understand how to do it, but it was really refreshing to see the, 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 the guys typically, traditionally working in the fuel station adopting to this and saying, oh, wow, this is just the next level of our filling station. There's a lot of education needed in the installing and the support side of things, how we support our, our hardware and other hardware in the industry. The customer education, I think today is really, it's the first attempt at putting something like this out. So I'd really like to get your feedback. Please throw it onto the chat, drop us an email. I'll share my email address just now. Let us know what you think of it, what you think we can do differently. Our objective would be to do more sessions like this, maybe more focused on a shopping center or more focused on particular types of customers. Today's was very much for consulting engineers to be able to advise customers and to get an understanding of the broadness of this technology that we're working with. Customer education to understand how to work with the different systems. General public, you know, when I stop at a charging station, it, it takes a good five or ten minutes first to answer all the questions before I can even get to plug my car in. Because people are really interested and they've seen the technology that's going out there. We spend a lot of time working with the different OEMs um, in getting them to understand 
how the technology is. They work with electric cars, but for the people that are putting these cars on the road, they haven't worked with it every single day. It's not something that they really understand to that level. So we really spend a lot of time ensuring they understand, especially the payment systems, the management systems in the background, how all of that works. Maybe this is a good time just to tell you the way that it does work. I, I mentioned that there's an app on your phone. And basically what you can do is you would load that app with money. It's called Charge Pocket. Once, the, once you've got your money in it, but basically you can then see how much money you've got available. You can see what charging sessions you are and you can just kick off a charge. You can at any point monitor how your charge session is going. You can stop it. You can see how much it's costing you, et cetera. There's great mapping programs. I'll show you the, the maps as well as we move on for the last few slides. There are standards, nothing officially adopted in South Africa uh, under the what's called the NRCS, so the National Regulator of Compulsory Specifications. But we are, we are complying with the European standards, so those standards have already been accepted by the SABS. We just, they just need to go through the final step of then saying this is now compulsory and that will be through the NRCS. We need a national support network. We need charges everywhere, so it doesn't help if you put charges in a town and you can't get there on the highway. So that was one of the objectives of grid cars, but certainly as other customers look to enhancing that network and growing that network, we'd be very keen to get involved with those. This shows you the map of what it looks like currently in South Africa. At last count, if I remember, it was 46 um, stations that were, were installed. Um, this shows not only the grid cars ones, it does show some other sites as well. Through a um, company called um, EV Crowd Route, they also put in charges in, in some of the smaller towns but their charges will also be listed here. And basically, there's a roaming agreement with them and grid cars. So our card works on their network, their cards work on our network. But everybody's sharing and getting this technology going. We just want to see charges out there. Um, somebody once said to me, oh, but you know, would you want um, would you want competition in a particular area? And I'll pick Beaufort West. Yes, please, because if my charger is down in Beaufort West, the customer is stuck. So it's really important that we get three or four charges down in Beaufort West over time. So this, the market will grow and it will expand. We, the more people we can get into this market, rolling out hardware and infrastructure, the better it is for now. That's where we want to be. We want to see more people that we can spread that load across, that we can have options. You'll see along the N2 at the bottom, there's a lot of options. You don't have to stop at every charger anymore because they now, some of them are 60 kilometers apart. So you could look and say, oh, I'll skip this one down onto the other one. They've got better food that side, or not, I, I like their coffee. That gives you some indication of where, where the technologies are going. When we move over to the solar systems, we work with our sister company I mentioned earlier, um, Solar F. You know, one of the big projects they've done, Mall of Africa, 4.7 megawatts. Clearly, if you're looking at a solar solution or you're looking at a backup or a solar solution, that's something that we can certainly look at getting involved in talking about. This just gives you some idea of all of our customers. So these are all customers who have already installed charging stations. In some cases, they've been part of the highway, and in other cases, they are clients that have um, taken, a, taken systems on and are starting to look at how they're going to develop their business models around this. You probably find a lot of your customers in that group. A big part of this was getting through understanding legally. So these, these companies all understand how the technology works now, how the contracts are working, how the billing systems are working. And it really helps when you start to sell charging systems into those networks. If you do work with grid cars, we are a level 1BE company, very happy to help with anything and to provide the technology that you need to take your things forward. So thank you for listening to this webinar. It's quite an experience to have an audience that doesn't talk back to you. I, I, really, I really do miss that. 